Um, okay. Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, I feel that I owe you some sort of confession at the beginning that I am not an archaeologist. Um, I'm not even a historian. Um, I'm a literature student. Um, so I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Liverpool. Um, I did my Masters in Science Fiction Studies. Um, Liverpool has the largest science fiction um, collection of primary and secondary material uh, outside of North America, if you didn't know that. Um, and I did my PhD there, which I recently completed. My PhD was on the Holocaust in what I called non-mimetic fiction, which is just a fancier way of saying non-realist fiction. But you have to be very careful about what words you use when you discuss the Holocaust, particularly in titles, because you don't want to end up in web searches with very distasteful um, material when you're talking about like fantasy and things like that. Um, so it was basically on science fiction, fantasy, and alternate history in relation to the Holocaust. Um, so yeah, I wrote an abstract for this conference, um, and uh, you called my bluff. So uh, we'll see how this goes. Thank you very much. Um, and yeah, what an excellent session we've had so far. I've enjoyed all the papers very much from my slightly different perspective. So the texts I want to talk about are alternate history texts. It's probably important that I just make sure we all know what I'm talking about when I say alternate history. So for a start, despite um, the whole concept of this session, I don't actually think of alternate history as a subgenre of science fiction. I think of it as a related next, like genre next door. Um, it has its own lineage within literature, um, which if you're feeling really generous, you can stretch back as far as Livy in 25 BC. Um, certainly with regards novels and modern narrative conventions, the genre finds its roots in French literature with uh, Geoffrey Chateau's Napoleon et la Conquête du Monde in 1836. That said, in the last century, it has become entangled with science fiction and fantasy and shares many of the same concerns, methods, tropes, and indeed authors and publishers. So alternate history is a thought experiment injected with a narrative in the same way in which science fiction is a what if story based on a scientific, quite often quite loosely scientific question. So too alternate history is a what if question premised on a historical question. So what if the Black Death had been even worse and decimated European civilization beyond recovery. What if the American Revolution had failed? No Hamilton musical. Now that would be a disaster. <laughs> um, what if Kennedy had survived his assassination? Um, they go to Mars. Um, a, the space race pushes on. Um, and of course, what if Hitler had won the Second World War? Um, so we call this the Hitler wins scenario. Um, of all the periods covered in alternate history, the most popular is the Second World War, with very close competition from the American Civil War. Um, it's also worth noting that not all Second World War alternate histories are Hitler wins scenarios. There are many alternate histories which avoid the Second World War happening at all, or which see the Axis powers defeated under slightly different circumstances. For example, uh, Michael Chabon's superb um, Yiddish Policeman's Union, which I highly recommend to fans of detective novels, um, uh, through various things, posits a war that ends in 1946 with the nuclear bombing of Berlin. Meanwhile, uh, Norman Spinrad's The Iron Dream, which is batshit crazy, um, <laughs> posits a world in which the war doesn't happen at all. Hitler's um, political career never really takes off, so he pursues his other, uh, his other love, which we all know was art, um, and he emigrates to America, <laughs> becomes an artist, who then becomes an artist for pulp magazines, who then becomes a writer of pulp short stories. Um, and this book is actually... Um, Norman Spinrad presents Adolf Hitler's The Iron Dream, and it's supposed to be this like novel that Hitler wrote that won the Hugo Award, which is the big <laughs> award in science fiction. Um, it is bonkers. It's also out of print. Um, I don't think they'd know how to market it. You can pick it up really cheaply everywhere, though. Um, it is ridiculous. I had great fun writing about that. But unfortunately, this isn't one I'm here to talk about today. So today I'm going to restrain myself to those Hitler wins scenarios, um, because within that kind of sub-subgenre, there is the, um, an element that really fascinates me with regards to the treatment of the Holocaust. So even as Soviet armies were advancing on the extermination camps um, in the predominantly, predominantly in the eastern territories of Germany, um, or the territories that Germany had occupied, pardon, 
Um, the Nazis continue their campaign of extermination. If anything, they ramp up activity in the gas chambers and furnaces. Then once it becomes clear that the camps are soon going to be overrun, they empty the camps and death march the, um, any prisoners who can walk back it towards Germany's interior. The marches, um, oh, and they dynamite um, the furnaces and the gas chambers and try and remove as much evidence of the scale of their activities as they can. The marches serve a similar activity uh, purpose to the dynamite. They remove the prisoners from potential liberation so that they can't tell their stories. Thousands of prisoners die of exposure to the elements, um, starvation and exhaustion, and many others were shot on the side of the road during the march. There were other reasons for moving the prisoners as well. The SS view them as a resource for use in slave labor, so you know they don't think it's over yet, they can still use them. And if they do think it's over, well, maybe they can be a bargaining chip in whatever ceasefire might be arranged. But the dominant reason for moving them was the erasure of evidence. One last attempt to uh, not only eliminate the majorities of Jews in Europe, but also to control history's narrative and destroy their story as well. Even though they lost the war, the Nazis were still relatively successful in this aim. Um, and there is still much that we do not know about the activities of the extermination camps. With archaeological evidence, um, see I got some archaeology in, um, only recently starting to uncover a lost past um, at Sobibor by Israeli archaeologist Yoram um, Haimi and Polish archaeologist Wojciech Mazurgek and um, in Treblinka with Caroline Sturdy Cole's work. Um, both um, digs have been going on since 2007 and they are two recent examples that have greatly expanded our knowledge of the methods and scale of the devastation. As Holocaust historian uh, Deborah Littstadt has said, the use of archaeology offers the possibility of giving us information that we didn't have before. It gives us another perspective when we are, we are at the stage when we have very few people who can speak in the first person singular. Lipstadt here is obviously making reference to the fact that we are entering a post-survivor era of, the, of Holocaust research, one in which there will be no voices left to talk about the genocide who experienced it firsthand. As the Holocaust becomes post-survivor, and indeed post-perpetrator and post-bystander as well, there is the danger that for the general population it loses an emotional urgency and resonance and becomes part of the dry textbook of history. Sorry to say that to people who work with history all the time. Um, new archaeological finds, such as these by Sturdy Coles, go some way to preventing this, as they provide new stories, new insights and information previously inaccessible or, more often than not, unknown entirely. Fiction, I would argue as a literature student, also provides a service, bringing narratives to life and maintaining an emotional connection with the past. Now, the combination of fiction and the Holocaust is controversial and I'm not going to go into that debate today but there you will find Holocaust scholars who completely deny the capacity of fiction to deal with the Holocaust. Um, survivor Eli Weisel, um, winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, um, famously said a novel is either, um, I've got to get this right because I didn't actually write it down, a novel is either, um, no a book about Treblinka is either not about Treblinka or not a novel, it can't be both. Um, and he, he came up with various formulations on that. Um, other people disagree and, and they're generally the ones that I kind of favour in my arguments, obviously. <coughs> Alternate history, anyway, um, along with other speculative fictions, acts through non-mimetic impulses, so these non-realist impulses, to reinvigorate narratives. So Frederick Jameson um, writes of historical fabulations that agency steps out of the historical record itself into the process of devising it and new, multiple, or alternate strings of events rattle the bars of the national, traditional, and the history manuals. Um, there are those, of course, who will find the idea of um, rattling um, unpalatable, insulting, or horrifying when we're talking about the Holocaust. However, an event such as the Holocaust is too important to be simply allowed to fade into the history books. Conversely, and perhaps more importantly, for an event so prone to sacralization, there's the danger of mythologizing. The rise to prominence of non-mimetic fiction of the Holocaust and the dawning of the post-survivor era is not a harbinger of the end of the Holocaust as a historical event. On the contrary, by redirecting the Holocaust's narratives through these non-mimetic impulses, fiction is able to revitalize the historical narrative, keeping it visceral, living, and reminding us of its continued contemporary relevance. 
Alternate histories are by their very nature concerned with the construction of historical narrative. Texts which explore the Hitler wins scenario are thus commonly drawn to the obfuscation of the final solution, in line with the Nazis' historic plans. The Polish, and, uh, the Polish composer and violinist uh, and Holocaust survivor Simon Lax um, recalled being told as much by an SS officer in Auschwitz who told him that, according to the instructions of the Fuhrer himself, not even one halfling should come out alive from any concentration camp. In other words, there will be no one who can tell the world what has happened here in the last few years. But even if such wit witnesses should be found, and this is the essence of the brilliant plan of our Fuhrer, no one will believe them. With this in mind, if the Nazis won the Second World War and controlled all of Europe and perhaps more, then they would not only inevitably follow through on their campaign, campaign of extermination, but they would also control the narrative afterwards. How then would the Holocaust be presented in texts of this nature? So the first actual text that I want to show you is Philip K. Dick's The Man in the High Castle. Um, we've already heard how, um, how Dick was very um, concerned with memory, and this is very true. And this follows through in this book where we have characters who doubt their beginnings, their origins, their personal histories, but it also completely devastates and unpicks our notions of history's history. Um, it's probably the best known alternate history, um, possibly at all, but certainly within the Hitler Wins um, canon, um, partly because of a recent adaptation by Amazon, but I'm going to be sticking to the book. So the plot centers on characters existing in, on the fringes of um, the Nazi empire. Um, that is, they live mainly in Japanese-occupied California, or in a neutral buffer zone which is formed around the Rocky, Rocky Mountains to separate the two victorious powers. As such, Dick spares us most of the severe excesses of the Nazis, um, and we only learn about the Germans and their empire through mainly second-hand sources and speculation. A key theme of the novel is that of authenticity and duplication. It's best expressed by the character Wyndham Mason, who is a supplier in artifacts from pre-war um, independent America. Um, in one scene, he compares two antique cigarette lighters with regards to their historical importance and thus their value to collectors. One of these two Zippo lighters was in Franklin D. Roosevelt's pocket when he was assassinated, and one wasn't. One has historicity, a hell of a lot of it, as much as any object ever had, and one has nothing. You can't even tell which is which. There's no mystical plasmic presence, no aura about it. It's all a big racket. I mean, a gun goes through a famous battle like the Muse are gone, and it's the same as if it hadn't, unless you know. It's in the mind, it's in the mind, not the gun. So historicity here is, an, is presented as a socially agreed upon construct, and assign, something assigned to an item by consensus of, in this um, particular example, a seller and a buyer. In this regard, it's similar to the representation of history itself as an agreed upon uh, narrative between historian and public. This takes on particular resonance and is given particular irony when it's revealed that many of the antiques that Wyndham Mason sells are actually fakes. Uh, they're manufactured to order and their provenance is a work of fiction. Um, Dick highlights the fragility of our w view of history by including within um, The Man in the High Castle a novel, um, a novel within a novel, um, which is also an alternate history and it's called The Grasshopper Lies Heavy. It's written by Hawthorne Abenton. Um, so rather than act simply acting like a mirror so that the characters can look back at our world, Grasshopper acts as a window into yet another reality, another history. Um, Japan is defeated in Grasshopper Lies Heavy, but there's no Pearl Harbor. Churchill and the United Kingdom win in Europe, um, helped by a crucial victory in North Africa, but Britain finishes the war as an industrial military superpower and is able to maintain control of its empire. Post-war, the United States becomes a more peaceful and tolerant society, eliminating racism by the 1950s. Ultimately, this world is just as alien to our timeline as the world of High Castle. Thus, Grasshopper allows us to reassess the Hitler wins timeline of High Castle. We are put in the bizarre situation of considering it a more plausible world than the one in which the Axis lose the war. A mirroring made even more bewildering by a brief moment when another character stares into a piece of jewellery and is transported into a third reality, our reality. Um, 
Dick expressly, because it's a bit ambiguous about whether it is our reality, but Dick um, expressly in other writings says that it is, and he talks about it in terms of the yin-yang dialectic, so the whole is contained in the part. Thus, uh, Mr. Tagomi, the character who's transported, is a fictional person in a work of fiction produced in our universe. Our world contains the man in the high castle, which contains our world, which contains the man in the high castle, which contains and so on and so on. Um, by embedding our world within High Castle, and vice versa, and by making the world of Grasshopper as strange to us as to the characters living in the High Castle timeline, Dick simultaneously highlights the symbiosis of the world, even whilst Mr. Tagomi is undergoing severe estrangement. Dick's novel collapses realities upon each other, ours and two alternates, and in doing so it problematizes notions of truth and history. The epicenters of these collapses are artifacts, Wyndham Mason's antiques, Copies of the novel Grasshopper Lies Heavy and Mr. Tagomi's Jewelry. These physical artifacts of history act as an anti archaeology, moving us further from anything resembling historical truth rather than closer to it. Dick bleeds these three realities together in such a way that John Reader um, writes that the novel is most usefully seen not as an alternate history, but rather a complex set of metafictional possibilities concretized by objects and texts. This is disturbing because, as um, this is disturbing because as our, in our world, um, that makes no sense whatsoever, uh, <laughs> skip that bit, um, yeah, so oh, the, the world um, of Grasshopper doesn't resemble our world, but the Hitler wins scenario has some eerie similarities to California of the 1960s, so therefore we see ourselves in the world in which the Nazis are triumphant, and if we in the triumphant Nazis worlds are so interchangeable, then they start to become indistinct with regards to their reality. What does that say about the human capacity for genocide, or for lack of a better word, evil? Dick writes that simple clear answers to these questions, why did the Nazis do what they do, will we do it, and are we also guilty, defy us, they can't be had. Um, and indeed, in the seven years he spent preparing to write High Castle, I don't know if you know about Philip K. Dick's process, he would research and prepare for a long period, then he would take a lot of amphetamines and coffee <laughs> and write the entire novel in one sitting. So he would prepare, 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 and then burn out, and that's why he died relatively young. Um, academic, those of you still doing your PhDs are thinking, huh? <laughs> um, but yeah, so he said that while he was preparing to write it, he wasn't... Um, uh, so much shocked by what he was researching from these various sources, if anything it only galvanised his hatred of fascism. Um, skipping to the end of this quote for time's sake, fascism and Germany are not intimately linked. Fascism is a worldwide phenomenon. It, um, it can hit a bunch of baboons swinging through the trees in Polynesia. Um, I don't know if they have baboons in Polynesia or if indeed they swing through trees. Um, they can all suddenly um, put on iron, iron helmets and march around. Fascism is very much with us today, boys and girls, and it's still the enemy. Um, this is obviously de as depressingly relevant today as it was in 1976 when he made this comment. So um, I really am running out of time. Um, so we're going to really speed through. That's not really supposed to be there. We're going to really speed through the second case that I was going to present. Um, so alternate history is also great because it draws in lots of different types of authors. It's not just science fiction authors. You get um, Pulitzer Prize winners like Michael Chabon and Philip Roth, um, people like Stephen Fry have written alternate histories, um, and journalists and historian uh, turned historical fiction writers uh, like Robert Harris. So he wrote um, Fatherland um, in 1992. It's set in 1964, but in a world in which the Germans um, and the Nazis have straddled Europe. Um, uh, all of the bits that are outside of the Greater German Reich are still satellite states um, controlled by public governments. The main character is Xavier March. He's a homicide detective in the plainclothes police in Berlin, and he is sent to um, investigate the murder of Josef Bula. Um, Josef Bula is an actual historical Nazi official. He was the governor general of the occupied Polish territories um, in our timeline, in, by which means that he was um, basically in charge of um, the territory upon which the concentration extermination camps were predominantly built. Discovering this body leads March down a series of routes that cause him to clash with his superiors as well as with the uh, um, even more sinister Gestapo. And he basically, in the course of um, investigating this murder, uncovers the fact that it is only one in a series of murders and that they are all part of a conspiracy by the Reich to cover up 
and the disappearance of the Jews, which all of the Germans um, living in Berlin that we encounter just politely kind of don't think about. Um, they just went east, um, and there's this kind of willing this suspension of disbelief. Um, da, 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 da. Um, so he 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 um, is forced then to become not just a policeman but to become a historian. So he goes digging around in archives. Um, and uh, learns information and he tries to use this information as a shield during an interrogation calling out the names. Uh, Glover says no one will ever believe it and should I tell you part of you can't believe it either and that's true. So the research there isn't enough. What he has to do is take it one step further, go from historian to archaeologist and so towards the end of the novel he drives out to the site of Auschwitz um, pursued by um, you know sinister forces and there's this quite powerful scene um, where he um, is stumbling around in the dark he's gonna die any second you know the, the, they're closing in on him and he just needs some physical proof that this has happened so that he has an item of truth to hold on to and so he is then transfers to becoming something of an archaeologist um, and he finds a brick and then he realizes it's not just one brick it's 10, 20, 100. This um, exponential increase in bricks obviously kind of mirroring the kind of exponential um, increase in the slaughter that he's discovered. Um, so basically to kind of really just bring it all together, both of these novels show us that history is, uh, they highlight the fact that history is composed of narratives which are constructed. They problematize the idea that the people constructing them are not always necessarily trustworthy, either because they're not real or they're part of some you know, construct, like in Philip K. Dick, or they have ulterior motives, such as in the Harris novel. But what that does um, is that it creates a, a question about the moral relativism. There is a tendency within our, our way of thinking about the Second World War, Nazis bad, therefore we good, and we gloss over the bad things that we have done in history. Um, we say they exterminated the Jews, we liberated the camps, therefore we are the heroes. The fact that there's a bystander thing where you know we could have done it sooner, there are other various kind of, you could have taken more refugees, etc, etc, um, and also that we committed our own atrocities, whether you want to talk about Dresden or Hiroshima or whatever. So both of these questions kind of undermine those, those uh, myths of the Second World War and uh, they vaguely use archaeology to do it, which is why I thought I'd talk about it. Um, and I'm way out of time, so I'm happy to discuss this in questions on over lunch, etc. Et Thank you for having me.